Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Leona Liu, and it's my pleasure to introduce this session, which is hosted by Resilient Landscapes. Resilient Landscapes is a new venture created and powered by C4 ICRAF. Our mission is to connect public and private actors in co-beneficial landscapes, provide evidence-based business cases for nature-based solutions and green economy investments, leverage and de-risk performance-driven investments with combined financial, social, and environmental returns. I wanna start off our session with a powerful quote from the American biologist E.O. Wilson, who launched the word biodiversity into our lexicon. He said, destroying rainforests for economic gain is like burning a Renaissance painting to cook a meal. Coronavirus has shown us that we need to urgently change our short-sighted thinking and our economy to recognize that human wealth depends on nature's health. COVID-19 is nature's SOS signal. It brings into laser sharp focus the need for our society to live within our planet's means. Our political, corporate and financial leaders need to wake up. Data from the UN Environment Program show that per person, our global stock of natural capital has declined nearly 40% since the early 90s, while produced capital has doubled and human capital has increased by 13%. At present, the biodiversity dividend is poorly calculated and allocated. Do no harm approaches to biodiversity are often inadvertently causing harm. And yet, biodiversity has an enormous potential to de-risk landscape level investments. How? Well, we have an exciting program lined up for you today that will demonstrate some innovative entry points. We'll also be sharing what resilient landscapes can do for you, from biodiversity baselines to measurement methods. Our session will feature two dynamic panels. One on the topic of raising finance for biodiversity and the importance of natural capital, and the other on safeguarding biodiversity through sustainable agricultural supply chains. We are thrilled to hear opening remarks now from Dr. Thomas E. Lovejoy, known as the godfather of biodiversity. He has been active in Amazon science and conservation since 1965. He has held various prestigious roles, including the Chief Biodiversity Advisor to the World Bank and the Executive Vice President of the World Wildlife Fund. Let's have a listen. Every organism on this planet, you, me, a soil microorganism, has a 3.7 billion year heritage. Much is lost when a species goes extinct. All that experience, what it contributes in ecosystem services, its unique set of solutions to its biological challenges, and all that can mean for a better future. The diversity of life is under great threat, intertwined with the habitability of the planet for people. I needn't recite the statistics, but I should flag the pandemic, which stems directly from the ways we have been assaulting nature, plus wild animal trade and markets. A large part of the threat comes from ever-expanding agricultural systems. Yet scientists have shown the coming billions can all be fed a reasonable diet without destroying another square meter of nature. Through greater efficiency and productivity, drastic reduction of food waste, and modifications of diet. But as Ed Wilson once said, God is in the details. The details of land use and forms of agriculture, the restoration of degraded land conditions. At a time of climate change, we need to be restoring natural connections in landscapes so species can track their required conditions. In the end, this all means we have to invert our historic pattern of remnant natural areas isolated in agricultural landscapes. 
to one in which agriculture, human well-being, and aspirations are embedded in natural landscapes. Those were wise words indeed. I now have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Gonzalo Munoz, who is nominated by the Chilean presidency and the United Nations to be the COP25's high-level climate champion. Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Thank you for, for inviting me and, uh, and let me start by referring to what we probably all read yesterday at, uh, at The Guardian. Knowing that we have uh, the, the, the um, information that banks lent $2.6 trillion linked to ecosystem and wildlife destruction in 2019 is something that uh, should make us reflect on what's the road on finance uh, nowadays in this critical moment that we are facing. Uh, so definitely we require ambitious action and smart finance. We must continue reminding decision makers we are reaching planetary tipping points and need to urgently deliver systemic transformation for people and planet. The cost of inaction far outweighs the investment finance required for a healthy, resilient recovery. And this is proven by numerous search sources of uh, research. As a farmer myself, I know conventional agriculture greatly impinges on all planetary boundaries thresholds. And unless transformed away from conventional models that are resource uh, and carbon intensive, and towards regenerative methods that can draw down carbon, it will continue to be one of the main drivers of biodiversity loss and climate change. This is the decisive decade and decisions made this year to face COVID-19 will be fundamentally crucial in shaping this decade and beyond and should set us on course uh, to net zero by 2050. Indeed, as we speak, leaders are detailing economic recovery that if well leverage could provide unprecedented opportunity for solving the climate crisis through a combination of public and private finance, where the former provides investment return in the multiple benefits to the general public of a nature smart investment, and the later drives private entrepreneurship and innovate, innovation towards financial results that are good for both shareholders and stakeholders alike. The issue of financial disclosure will be absolutely pivotal to ensuring that investment is aligned with SDGs and enhanced NDCs, and the hidden costs often externalized to the public and are internalized and borne by investors that sending the right market signals towards businesses that is good for nature, good for society, and of course, good for the economy. The newly established task force on nature-related finance disclosure is therefore a timely and welcome development for setting common ground on this crucial area. We know investment in nature and nature-based solutions are not only cost-efficient measures, they also provide key multiple co-benefits, which also support greater equity globally. In recent reports with recommendations for decision makers, the WEF indicated that tackling the global nature crisis could create 400 million jobs and $10 trillion in business value each year by 2030, while also delivering on the environment and social imperatives of the decade. Also expanding protected areas to 30% of our planet results in financial benefits exceeding the cost by a factor of at least five to one and economic output averaging $250 billion annually. We know that restoring degraded forests generates between seven to $30 in economic benefits for every dollar investment. So this year and next year with my friend and fellow high level champion from the UK, Nigel Topping, we will do many efforts to catalyze net zero commitments across non-state actors and net zero ambition in the global finance sector uh, towards COP26. Through finance and nature-based solution work streams, we max, must accelerate transition through financial sector action that will help enable our key nature targets, including promoting protection of 30% land and ocean by 2030, ensuring restoration of 350 million hectares of degraded lands. 
we must double the protective land under regenerative agriculture and urgently restore soils health and its ability to deliver co-benefits like biodiversity drought and flood uh, control and carbon sequestration we have we must halt deforestation by promoting sustainable supply chains of traded uh, agriculture commodities to drive on efforts for COP26, we must understand accounting, promote disclosure, and mitigate the risk of nature loss from our businesses and operations. My experience in promoting the circular economy and multiple bottom line entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship like B Corps globally has shown me how fast change can happen once businesses and investment modes are reinvented to optimize for stakeholder values as opposed to merely the shareholders, and including nature as one stakeholder. High-level champions are committed to promoting collaboration to achieve net zero targets and promote resilience for which nature and nature-based solutions result essential. Fortunately, there is growing awareness that nature and the economic are no longer siloed and deepening, deepening interdependence is a reality also because of the growing mutual results. I believe we all recognize that environmental risk is financial risk and investing in green benefits, profit, people and planner are three steps that we can take now. We need a clear roadmap on how to change the fact that nature and nature-based solutions only receives a small percentage of climate finance relative to its potential contribution. We must unlock nature-based solutions potential of delivering 30% of the solutions by 2030. We need to agree to priority concrete targets and actions that will shift investment to nature-based solutions, truly mobilize investors and asset owners to green their portfolios and to be deforestation free. We must, of course, recognize the role that the Finance for Nature Global series can play to help advance the High Level Champions agenda and the Liberals for COP26, including through the Race to Zero Dialogues to be held in November, for which I invite all participants to attend the Race to Zero as well as we all address planetary emergency. I'd like to um, introduce my colleague, Christopher Knowles, who is a Senior Advisor on Environment and Climate Finance for Resilient Landscapes for the next uh, segment of this session, in which we'll start with his first panel. Christopher has been engaged in the finance of infrastructure, climate, and environmental assets for over 40 years, much of this time with the European Investment Bank. He is now the Senior Advisor on Environment and Climate Finance for Resilient Landscapes. Christopher, over to you. Thank you, Leona, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you can, I hope the sound is working good. Yep. Um, so this is going to be a panel about finance. It's a panel about driving investment capital into the natural capital space. I think we have to our, acknowledge our debt of thanks to Tony Simons for the title, which is intended to convey the idea that handled right that is to say, with appreciation for its value, then natural capital can be the source of financial value, of financial appreciation, as well as social and environmental appreciation. The session is intended to be practical. We have four great panelists. All of them are practitioners. All of them are doers. Three of them have been involved recently in the same transaction, which I hope they will talk to as a kind of a case study. And it'll give you a sense of what practical issues they meet on the ground. Next slide, please. I want to start, if I may, with some quick fire slides just to set the scene. This is all data drawn from the large number of very good reports which have appeared this year on the subject. That doesn't make the data right. This is all order of magnitude stuff. Um, Comparisons would be invidious, but I think we do need to accept that biodiversity is as much an existential issue as climate. We're in the middle of this pandemic nightmare. Many people are saying that everything has to come after social, economic and health recovery. But I think we also need to remember that if we don't have no nature, we don't have an economy to recover. If we don't have nature, we don't really have much of a population to worry about bringing back a society to bring back and if we have unhealthy nature, then for sure, we are going to be looking at more disease. So we have to start seeing natural capital as a finite resource. 
we have to start valuing it as such. We have to have the right systems of rewards and penalties. We have to make it easier to monetize and to capture some of the benefits and the costs so that the economic actors make better decisions which are aligned with societal and ecological needs. Next slide, please. Mark. The costs of doing nothing of inaction are extremely high and they will rise higher the longer we continue to do nothing. Already they are somewhere on the order of 20 trillion a year, plus minus five. The benefits of action and acting early can also be highly attractive, especially in a transition period when many jobs look likely to be lost forever. You see here some of the jobs and GDP benefits which it is estimated will be secured under the EU Natura 2000 program and also under the UN's 3030 program. Next slide, please. The total costs. Next slide, Michael. The total costs or the amount of capital needed are less than one trillion annually. The financing gap is a bit less than that even because there is a small amount of public money already flowing. But the big bucks, they have to come from the private sector. That is the only game in town big enough. We need less than 1% of the global pool of capital for biodiversity. So that's not massive from the investor perspective, but even that will not flow without policy intervention. The policymakers could start by reversing the perverse incentives that already see 500 billion a year of harmful subsidies go to agriculture and to forestry. That could already level out the playing field for sustainable practice, which can be a little bit more expensive in purely financial terms. That would already cover the majority of the financing gap. But I'm not holding my breath for that. I look at the subsidies which are still going to hydrocarbons rather than to renewables, so many years after we understood the problem of greenhouse gases from energy. There is some good news though, um, and that is that investors expect the share of environmental and social assets to rise sharply as a proportion of their portfolios. This is being driven by what they expect to come in terms of regulation. It's also being driven by growing awareness of the links between a healthy nature and a healthy economy. Next slide. On this page, we've just given you a random selection of some good news items which are around at the moment. On the panel today, we have Jasper Stam from Eco Business, who will hopefully elaborate on some of the good news that they are generating. And last night, for those of you who are listening, you would have heard Jennifer Price from Calvert and Martin Berg from Pollination, all of whom have made big announcements in the last week or two. Next slide, please. Another of our panelists, Fabian, is working to source sustainable investments for some, from some very large financial investors. And he's dealing on a daily basis with the shortage of bankable deals, deals that is, which have been well conceived on the basis of solid technical and scientific knowledge. The Resilient Landscapes Initiative is, we hope, one part of a solution to address the drought of bankable deals. It's not a sufficient solution, but it's offering us definitely a necessary condition for accelerating the deal flow. It wants to bring its huge depth of technical expertise. And as one person said, it's Amazon warehouse of scientific research. It's hundreds of scientists, many of them the best in the world in their field, their boots on the ground, and make all of this available to the investment community in the form of partnership with investors. Let me now stop on the slides and move over to the panel. Um, we have four speakers whom I will introduce as we go along. They've all been asked to look at some cross-cutting themes, um, issues affecting the movement of capital into sustainable agricultural issues, issues such as measurement and monitoring of impact, of avoidance of greenwash, of disclosure, of regulation, of the role of enhanced impact as a mitigant of risk and hence as a means of lowering the cost of capital, of constraints to deal flow, of access to TA. And finally, the $64,000 question, is the resilient landscapes proposition potentially helpful to you? The first of these, three of these speakers, as I mentioned, have been involved in a common deal earlier this year. And have I invited them to look at these issues through the prism of their deal and from their particular perspective. The fourth is trying to source investment opportunities in the space for major investors. So without further ado, Jasper, please come online if you would. 
Jasprit Stam is from Finance and Motion. Um, Finance and Motion is one of the most successful and impactful fund managers I have ever seen. And I've seen quite a few at this stage in my life. They currently manage over 2 billion in five or six funds. Jasprit has been a decade there, formerly with, after that she was with the Inter-American Bank and currently she's the investment director for the Africa window of the Eco Business Fund. Jasprit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in this virtual space interacting with you. And I'm here to talk about the Eco Business Fund and how it supports natural capital generation. Just some background about the fund. The Eco Business Fund's mission is to support biodiversity conservation, sustainable use of natural resources, and adaptation and mitigation to climate change and its effects. It is a debt fund that operates in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as more recently in Sub-Saharan Africa. The fund provides financing to companies and financial institutions that are directly or indirectly engaged in supporting environmentally sustainable activities, particularly in agriculture, but also forestry, fishery, and tourism. Along with financial support, the Eco Business Fund can also provide non-financial support and capacity building through technical assistance. Next slide, please. It is important to note that there is a limited pool of ready-made green investments. And this is where the work comes in to either boost the investability of sustainability-driven companies, companies with an inherent green business model, such as an organic food company, but where there may be, but where there, they may have difficulties in terms of their credit risk or that they're operating in a difficult operating environment. However, green assets can also come from boosting and reinforcing the green aspects of mainstream companies. In many cases, we find companies or financial institutions where there is a strategic interest from management to become more environmentally friendly in their operations and where there is also a business opportunity in doing so. And that can be in terms of attracting higher premiums, creating a more robust supply network, finding new markets or fresh clients. ETG falls under this category and you will hear more about why sustainability makes business sense for this company during the next session. By working with the Eco Business Fund, we can help translate that interest and opportunity into a financeable green asset. We have clear use of proceed requirements regarding what our financing can be used for. And this use of proceeds is matched through discussions with the institution and as well as a review of a loan portfolio in the case of financial institutions. This is also a helpful process for the company or financial institution to help them understand what is or could be green about their activities. As mentioned above, creating green assets is not just about the financing, but also about having non-financial support available in areas such as environmental and social risk management or supporting training of staff on green topics. Technical assistance also allows us to work at the sector level, including holding events that give the opportunity to learn from industry peers that are further ahead in sustainability topics. As an open-ended fund, there is the possibility for partner institutions to develop a long-lasting relationship with us over multiple financing cycles. Working with partner institutions over multiple financing rounds is where we can support even greater and deeper change. Next slide, please. Generating green assets is about the green part, but it is also about the investment part. As you can see from the graph, there is not always a strong match between where the most green opportunities lie and the investment, attract, in, investment environments that are attractive for private capital flows. We have over a decade of experience working on impact funds, such as the Eco Business Fund, which operate in developing markets. Investing in developing markets can bring a range of challenges, including high political risks, weak economies, incomplete regulatory or legal frameworks, as well as anti-money laundering risks. 
In order to be able to attract private capital into such markets, there is the need for intermediaries with the knowledge, tools, and processes to properly analyze and monitor the projects from various aspects, including credit risk, environment, environmental and social risk, as well as use of proceeds. An exciting development for us is being able to leverage this expertise now to not only create green assets for our impact funds, but also to act as a financial gateway and connect other capital providers in the market. We have recently achieved this with a new transaction with Calvert Impact Capital, where 40 million in assets generated by the Eco Business Fund in Latin America has been transferred in terms of direct exposure to Calvert. This is exciting as another solution in terms of being able to attract additional private capital into this important impact space at scale. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jasmine. That's great. I might come back to you on that uh, Calvert transaction, which you are absolutely right to say is a flagship for the world. Let me move swiftly on then to our next panelist, which is Andre van den Belt. Andre works with the ETC group, which is uh, and where he's the head of sustainability for cocoa and cashew. Um, ETC is one of the world's leading agro commodity trading houses. He personally has been involved in Coco for some 10 years and he's lived in West Africa for five of those years. So Andrew, the floor is yours and I hope you'll uh, give us a flavor of real life on the ground in West Africa with Coco. Yes, thank you very much, Chris, for, for having us. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, ETG is one of the largest uh, agro-commodity traders in the world and um, natural capital truly is an integrated part of a business. And that is not only because we are trading uh, a lot of commodities that are natural products like a cocoa, cashew or the pulses, but also because of our position. Um, unlike many other traders, we in fact uh, originated um, in these producing countries. So the company was founded more than 50 years ago in East Africa, and we've really built our business uh, from the bottom, uh, working directly with farmers uh, within the ecosystems uh, where we source products. So we have seen changes um, in the environment from, from, from a very short distance. And uh, that is something that has also been, let's say, realizing us um, in our daily business and uh, uh, supporting our uh, models with clients to change things and to uh, invest in natural capital. So today um, we will dive into uh, our, some of our cocoa supply chains. Uh, cocoa is one of these commodities where we've been investing substantially in uh, natural capital that is then more than 5 million uh, a year today. And that clearly didn't go overnight. So um, I will take you through a couple of, let's say, developments that we have seen in this particular sector and that we also, of course, hope to see in the other commodities that we are uh, working with and also in the different, uh, on the other industries um, that we are operating. So, Michael, next sheet, please. So, if we look into natural capital and cocoa, um, but the majority of the cocoa is being produced in West Africa and clearly natural capital was not the first priority of a lot of companies uh, when we started um, uh, operating in this domain. So um, if we go back in 2012, it was one of my first years when I started in uh, Ivory Coast in Ghana, where 70% of the world cocoa is coming from. And back then, uh, there was already some attention in terms of sustainable uh, sustainability initiatives, but mostly on certification and uh, production, sustainable production of cocoa and child labor issues. But natural capital on itself was not uh, a top priority uh, on the agenda. I remember one of my first presentations with a chocolate maker where I was talking about agroforestry systems and uh, payment for ecosystem services. And the first question I got after this presentation was, 30 minutes was where are all the children and why are you not building any schools in your proposal? And I think that is a bit the, um, let's say the, um, the priority setting that we had back then. Um, there was some activities going on in environmental services, but it was very limited and definitely not high on the agenda. 
Next sheet, please. So what we saw in 2016, next sheet, Michael. So, sorry, can you go back to 2016, Michael? I think this one get too fast. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm not sure um, why the contents uh, are a bit different here. Maybe it's because of the difference between the Windows and the Mac, Michael, but I hope for the participants, it's somehow uh, clear what we have mentioned here. And I will explain a bit further. So um, between 2012 and 2016, we have seen more and more industry players um, getting concerned about uh, issues on deforestation and climate change in cocoa. Uh, various reports have shown that uh, climate change would be one of the key issues in um, uh, on the production of cocoa, the availability of cocoa over the next uh, 50 years in West Africa. And we've also seen huge deforestation during the civil war in Ivory Coast, for instance. So what happened then is that uh, many of these industry players, they came together um, the companies together with the World Cocoa Foundation and the government institutes of uh, Ghana and Ivory Coast designed a deal, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative, and this is then representing more than 85% of the market that made a commitment to work towards zero deforestation in cocoa. And this is where we've seen a turnaround where we had not only um, the, um, the industry players and uh, the local companies getting involved and the governments, uh, it gave a clear message also to consumers and in the daily communication of the chocolate brands to consumers that uh, more needs to be done in this field. And this really triggered a lot of developments uh, also to where we stand today in 2020. Next sheet, Michael. So in 2020, we see a lot of investments going on. Um, we've seen also a shift where in the beginning, a lot of companies were looking into agroforestry systems, uh, very focusing very much on the cocoa farm itself, but then expanding this scope also to uh, off farming systems uh, and natural capital. So reforestation, payment for ecosystem services, and really focusing on a landscape uh, model, which was definitely not the case uh, five to 10 years ago. And this is a development that we're encouraging a lot. Uh, a lot of things in, uh, needs to be done, but it shows the commitments also of the industry not to only look into the only, the, their own supply chains and only the cocoa farms, but going beyond that and looking at the landscape level. And with the landscape level, that also comes with uh, additional partners, uh, looking with other commodities, um, looking uh, with other companies to get a more holistic approach. And that is the trend that we've seen in the last couple of years and that we are encouraging ourselves very much as well. Next sheet. So what our company is doing today is in fact, um, uh, indeed, first of all, making sure that we have the investments uh, to invest in our supply chains, because if we don't uh, show zero deforestation in our supply chains, we cannot upscale our cocoa business these days. So we have to invest to commit to uh, the targets of our clients as well, of the chocolate. And uh, this is being done by a lot of different initiatives we are increasing uh, agroforestry systems in our supply chains to mitigate uh, climate change, but we're also looking to biodiversity conservation models by payment for ecosystem services, for instance, and reforestation, and uh, also try to increase the investments by exploring um, carbon, payment, um, uh, carbon payment models. So eventually what we see is that uh, the market and the, the demand for uh, zero deforestation has and uh, encourage companies to, to be innovative and to come with uh, new approaches and to go beyond the, the standards and assurances that were there a couple of years ago. And that is uh, the trend that we also expect for the next coming years and hopefully soon in the other commodities uh, in these same regions as well. So this is a very brief overview of the things that we do uh, to date. Very soon, we will also uh, publicly announce our uh, framework of action with ETG that shows um, all of the numbers and the investments and um, the targets that we are setting in our zero deforestation work in COCO. And um, we will keep you posted through that through our public media channels.
Thank you very much, Andre. So uh, let's now go back onto our uh, agenda. Um, we have two panelists to go, and I know they have a number of interesting things to say, and I'm very anxious that they do have sufficient time. Uh, our next speaker is Martin Geiger, um, who is the Director for Sustainability at the uh, German Development Finance Company, DEG. Um, and Martin has been doing that job for some 10 years. Previously, he was with the World Wildlife Fund. He spent a lot of time with his boots on the ground in West Africa, in cocoa, in forestry, in water, in sustainable finance. And DEG was one of the um, protagonists of the, of the uh, transaction, which uh, Jasprit and, and, and Andre were talking about. They led a very large syndicated law. Thank you, Martin. I know you, we have been pushed a little bit, but if you can keep your comments as concise as possible, that would be helpful to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher, and uh, welcome. Um, yeah, just briefly about DEG. We are a development financial institution in Germany uh, uh, under, under KFW, uh, financing private sector in, um, in developing uh, countries and emerging economies. Uh, we have roughly a, a, a portfolio at the end of last year of nine nine billion euro, and had new deals, uh, one point eight billion uh, last year. Um, out of the overall financing, roughly five to eight percent also goes to the agribusiness and agriculture sector, and. Uh, we have a number of clients there, and it, it's for DEG. It's an important um, sector to to invest in because uh, it has high potential for development, uh, creating development impact, but also um, uh, it it is uh, providing jobs and, and 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 income opportunities for farmers on the ground. And you can also uh, contribute in working with companies like with ETG um, that you also uh, on the environmental and social side, you, uh, you create um, added value uh, in, in the supply chains. Um, I would like to, to highlight a, a, a few uh, four points. Um, the, um, we have provided EDG, and we, we are we are a long-standing partner with them since 2013. We have been part of financing with other financiers there, uh, but in in 2020 we had a, had a syndicated uh, finance uh, to EDG, where also uh, Eco Business Fund was part of, and we um, we. We are providing the finance for the working capital, but we had also, and that is part of our, next to our financial sustainability, of course, we are also looking into the environmental and social part of it, uh, of things, and, and uh, in accordance with the IFC performance standards. And uh, we were looking into where can, uh, where does ETG stand and where can it further develop? We, we highly we highly appreciate already over the years the, the kind of additional transparency and and also disclosure uh, ETG developed uh, and uh, and this allowed us also to look much more into detail of their management systems which is even online uh, right now um, and <clears throat> we we had agreed upon an action plan um, jointly. Um, which which highlights the uh, continued improvement of the management systems for the various also commodities but also other businesses uh, uh, ETG has, um, and um, the this adds at the at the end of the day also in for the for the specific commodities they are trading and going into the supply chain that we improve sustainability in those together with EDG in in those supply chains. And uh, one element of that is also that uh, with with all the different commodities, biodiversity is a key a key aspect to be looked at while while investing there. And if if ETG goes for new business, they will look in they will look into what are potential impacts they are having there, uh, and we are keen to to help them further in on on their journey they already uh, have undergone. And uh, in in general, what they have done in the cocoa business. Um, uh, they can learn now from CocoNet uh, uh, for other commodities uh, to to upgrade and uh, and achieve uh, higher uh, sustainability uh, goals there, uh, because 
in the, the difference is with other commodities, there are not as many clients yet which are looking into um, certification or into these sustainability aspects, but they are as, as needed as in the cocoa sector. Um, final uh, final uh, remark, uh, fourth topic, um, while focusing on, on, on uh, the, these uh, uh, landscapes and resilient landscapes, um, one key element for DEG in, in working on supply chains is also to consider the human rights and the, and the social aspects in, in, the, in the supply chains. And we, I would like to highlight that this also for us as a, a key element, child labor in, in cocoa is, is well known, but also in other commodities, we have social issues around the farmers and we highly value uh, the way how EDG is handling that. And we hope that uh, in the resilient landscapes, this will also be uh, getting its place it, it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Fascinating to hear your thought on how, how you have achieved some non-financial benefit through the intervention. That's really, really the core of what it's all about. Um, moving swiftly on then to our final panelist, um, Fabian Kuvler. Fabian, if you look at his LinkedIn site, describes himself wonderfully as a banker for nature. Um, I can't think of a better title to have as a banker. I always wish I had been a banker for nature. Until a year ago, he was with Credit Suisse. He'd been there a long time, latterly as head of green solutions. And I know from personal exposure that he did some path-breaking transactions there. Um, and no offense to Credit Suisse, but some of the announcements which had come from them in recent months, actually, Fabian was at the root of those initiatives some, some time back. So we have a really good man uh, for what I'm afraid is going to be the last intervention on this panel, because I think we have been uh, our timetable has been derailed, so I'm not expecting us to get Q&A time. Fabian, you've got the job not only of making your comments, but please uh, bringing together what you heard on the panel and please answering the question, uh, would resilient landscapes be helpful to you in the future? Thank you very much, Fabian. Sure, thank you, Chris. And let me share a few personal impressions about how the nature investment market has developed since early 2020. And I'm and, and happy to include some of the thought about how resilient landscapes will profit from that or are indeed endangered by the recent developments. First of all, I think the, the recent and still ongoing COVID crisis has helped to establish nature investing as a legitimate investment theme with mainstream investors. And the number of household names with active interest in deploying funds has exponentially increased uh, since March. And when I have been talking to these entities over the last few months, they often cited the fear of another green swan event as the reason for their accelerated involvement. And one can argue that these actors are arguably here to stay. I saw some of them going through tough internal decision processes in April and May, where they approved new nature-focused investment products that have a focus partly on landscapes and resilient landscapes and want to launch them later this or next year. I think on a less positive note related to the whole COVID situation, we're also seeing in our industry what the finance world would call distressed assets. From an investor's perspective, this might offer a welcome opportunity to invest at a bargain, uh, but more practically on the ground, it really means that projects often embedded in natural landscape initiatives are lacking the required funds to run their operations. And this obviously um, you know, eventually leads to detrimental impacts on su successful conservation outcomes that in many cases have been built up over a long time. From where I sit, I think there's a huge need for aligning capital markets with the protection of nature, its ecosystems, and the buildup of resilient landscapes. As Planet Tracker, a uh, UK-based think tank, pointed out a couple of weeks ago, fixed income markets alone are capable in the immediate term of mobilizing hundreds of billions of dollars for conservation. Through debt restructuring on the sovereign side, through new green or blue bond issuances by supranationals, sovereigns, municipalities, and last but definitely not least, corporates, where we see a lot more of these issuances coming to market. Another notable development is certainly something uh, that I would call systemic investing as compared to opportunistic investing. There is a willingness by more investors to dig deeper and understand impact beyond the fences of a particular portfolio or a company. Instead, what I see is portfolio construction is now approached through a systemic or indeed a landscape lens. And you know, after all, any of the investments that we do in our market are meant to lead to some kind of positive environmental outcome, 
But some outcomes are definitely better than others. And then as an industry, we need to have the ambition to finance these. A fourth development I see centers around the inclusion of new types of investors in a market that is fast growing and diversifying. Over the last few months, we've seen a number of corporates with nature-based supply chains having made you know, previously unseen announcements to invest significant money through either proprietary venture capital or private equity funds, or also through other means working with private investors and you know, working on joint ventures to invest into natural landscapes. I think it still remains to be seen to what extent these initiatives will serve the broader market rather than purely private interest. Uh, but there's definitely hope that the, the, these efforts will lead to more resilient landscapes financing overall. And maybe just a final point is on uh, the global investment market and the access to providing uh, more funding to nature with regards to the investment investor types that we've seen coming to market. Um, you know, I've had the privilege of working with a Dutch bank and a Dutch asset manager looking at whether retail clients in a country like the Netherlands could get access to institutional scale funding. And I think this is certainly an avenue that we see growing more and more. It's a third of the market that hasn't been addressed so far uh, when it comes to investing into natural landscapes. So in a nutshell, I, I you know, when, when I had to characterize the current state of the market, I really think there is a growing divergence between some of the bold capital commitments that we see by institutional investors and an increasing uh, but still smallish global pipeline of market ready opportunities that are often scattered and not included in a general landscape context. And we need to bring the two things together. I really sense we're at the tipping point now where we as an industry can move from niche to mainstream if we do it the right way and don't take any shortcuts. Fabian, thank you. I think that's that was uh, it was a great way to, to 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 bring things to a conclusion. So what you've heard here is a uh, first-hand flavor of what the institutional investors uh, are looking for, uh, where the issues can be. You've heard from the public perspective where the uh, how how the non-financial benefits, the social and environmental benefits, can come. You've heard from the corporate perspective how this kind of intervention and taking a more social and environmentally responsible approach fits into a corporate strategy. And from Jaspreet, you've heard from uh, an asset management point of view, uh, how they're trying to balance uh, the respective demands of investors and opportunities on the, on the ground. Um, I believe as we are now nearly 15 minutes overdue, I uh, think, the follow-on panel is never going to speak to me again. I know there's a lot of talent in there if I don't hand over to them. So I think without further ado, I need to um, give the floor to, to, to Howard Shapiro's panel. Howard, many of you will know, um, very eminent scientist in his field, and uh, he's going to lead a more technical scientific panel. To my panel, I want to say thank you very much indeed for being available today and for the contributions you've made. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. It's an extraordinary conversation that we've just heard about the potential for financing to come forward in a way that it's never happened before, for a recognition of the scale of financing that most of us had never thought about in our lifetimes. So I would like to go through a few slides to begin with um, and give you an idea about biodiversity and the resilient agricultural landscape systems that we're talking about, and then turn it over to three distinguished panelists. First slide, please, Michael. In some of our lifetimes, we've seen things like this happen the Mucha Atlantica rainforest in Bahia, Brazil, was one of the most diverse places on earth. And one can see from agriculture, both tree crops, row crops, and cattle, an almost total destruction of this extraordinarily diverse area of the world. At one point, it was counted 287 tree species per hectare. Next slide, please, Michael. And when we think about what we have lost, we turn to E.O. Wilson, who was the first one to use the term biodiversity. 
And when he says we should preserve every scrap of biodiversity as priceless while we learn to use it and come to understand what it means to humanity, it's so important to realize whether it's the function of climate change, the fun function of food, fodder, fuel, all of these areas, it's so important to understand what this biodiversity means to us and how we learn to measure it and how we learn to protect it. Next slide, please, Michael. And when we hear people like Tom Lovejoy, who just spoke a minute ago, we sometimes think it, we're holding it in higher esteem than people, biodiversity. But then he talks about, is it between a rich or an impoverished existence for man or for humankind? And then in a project in Ethiopia, to be able to read a quotation that said, Northern Ethiopia is now greener than it has ever been during the last 145 years. And human investments, human investments have overridden the impact of climate change. These are profound comments, an area that looked like a moonscape. And now it looks like a thriving community and people who had abandoned these communities are returning to these places due to the richness of the activity. Next slide, please. A few facts about some large rainforest. The Amazon holds one of 10 species on earth and it's home to more than 30 million people. The great Congo Basin rainforest accounts for 18% of the remaining world's rainforest. And in Borneo, there's a forest that's estimated to be 130 million years old, two times as old as the Amazon rainforest in Africa, in South America, excuse me. These are, these are places that cannot be replaced once they're gone. An individual tells you, I'll design for you a rainforest that's just like what we've cut down is delusional. It can't be done. The system is really very, very different than a simple plan on a piece of paper. Next slide, please. So what haven't we solved? Well, I think there are a series of questions we have to answer. The challenges agree amongst multiple actors and stakeholders. Do we have the right data for the information that we're thinking about if we have an agriculture performance system? Are we analyzing that information appropriately? And are we using it to drive performance? And performance is critical. And with 120 global certification bodies today, today more than 120, it seems we are no closer to resilient agricultural landscapes, prompting three reactions I think all of us have. How do we define performance? How do we measure performance? And how do we drive performance? Next slide, please. So a number of us met in 2017 at Kew Garden, a cross section of industry, NGOs, activist organizations, farmers, for-profit, not-for-profits, the entire group met together under Chatham House rule with scientists. And we thought, what would be the five metrics of an agriculture performance system? Productivity, obviously, it's a critical aspect for protecting the fires. Profitability, environmental stewardship, social inclusion, and good governments. If we could define, monitor, and implement that, we would have a system that would be a living system. It is a change of theory. Next slide, please. So we have three ways to enter this, through the commodity, through the landscape, or through the individual performance metric. Next slide, please. So I wanna thank you uh, let's all join forces together 
No one institution will do this by themselves. This is a global activity. Today's panel represents a cross section of players, activists, and scientists who have spent their lives working on biodiversity and agricultural systems. I'd like to introduce first and ask a question of Jason Clay, a longtime collaborator of mine and close friend. Jason, you've been involved in the protection of large landscapes for more than 30 years. Tell us about your understanding of the nexus between biodiversity and resilient landscapes. And what have you learned about the protection of biodiversity and the areas of human use? What will help this happen? Thanks for the introduction, Howard. Um, let me just give a little bit of background. Uh, my training is in anthropology and international agriculture. I grew up on and ran a farm before going to college. Uh, I've focused on human rights and indigenous people and uh, also working on reducing the impacts of food production on the environment and using uh, companies and corporate supply chains to help actually produce, uh, reduce impacts on the ground. Let me, let me just make a few observations or even conclusions to start with and then I'll, I'll go into a few more background details. I think we have to realize uh, that if the choice comes down to feeding a child or cutting a tree, the tree's going to lose every one. And so we've got to figure out how to save biodiversity on a planet with more people, with more money, and with more consumption, and with different kinds of consumption that have big impacts. If we're going to succeed, first of all, we need markets to change behavior. We don't have biodiversity markets. We don't even have carbon markets yet. Most of the world doesn't really have water markets. We need new business models, business models that not only employ more people, but give them assets and value their contributions. We need to see this as a bottom up kind of area. Third, we see a lot of commitments from companies, but from my world, especially as a former farmer, this is kind of like a game of golf. The companies come out with a new stick for every problem they're trying to solve. Where are the carrots? Where are the incentives for producers to change? What's in it for them? How do we make that happen? And then how do we measure the results? That's gonna be the real, the real trick. So I wanna talk about two types of landscapes. One is more natural landscape where I've had some experience in, and it's kind of the Amazon rainforest. And the other is landscapes, what I would call working landscapes and bringing biodiversity back into working landscapes. In the first case, I started working in the late uh, 1980s. I was, uh, my organization was the beneficiary of, of money from a Grateful Dead concert to protect the rainforest. And we worked with indigenous people and rubber tappers in Brazil. And afterwards, a guy named Ben came up to me and said, well, what can I do to save the rainforest? And once we figured out that it was Ben from Ben and Jerry's, uh, I said, well, you got to make an ice cream and you got to use Brazil nuts. And the rest was kind of history. I went to Brazil, brought back a couple of kinds of nuts, three oils, 10 different fruits, uh, honey, some natural food coloring, Drove it up to New Hampshire. Ben and I made the first batch of Rainforest Crunch. Actually, we made about 20 batches of Rainforest Crunch before we settled on one uh, and served it to the Board of Ben Jerry's that night. It was his 40th birthday, so they were there. It was a go. They didn't do focus groups. They didn't do anybody else. We it just had a contract to go and buy Brazil nuts. So when I got to Brazil, what I found was that 35 to 40 percent of all the nuts currently rotted between where they were picked in the forest and traveling in open barges downstream to Manaus and Belém. So the first thing we did was build a factory in the forest that was owned by the people who collected the Brazil nuts. We reduced waste by down to 5%. And because we were able to reduce the waste, we actually were able to pay harvesters three times what they were being paid currently. The entire market had to double what they paid producers because the system was suddenly transparent. 
there was there was an honest broker, a trader involved that showed what the actual value was and where it where it accrued. We used long term contracts. The local group, the rubber tappers union, could borrow local working capital in local currency against those contracts. They employed 250 shellers. To make a long story short, they got the votes to take over politics in the town and then the municipality and then the state of Acre. And they ran that state for 20, 25 years until Bolsonaro kind of swept everybody out. But despite this success in the Western Amazon and spreading into Bolivia and Peru, we actually failed because we failed to scale and we failed to prove that making money from existing forest was more valuable than clearing the land for farming. And partly because we didn't scale, partly because we didn't address the values of the people who were clearing the land. And so there's a, there's a, big, a big lesson there. Uh, and deforestation continued elsewhere and continues this day uh, in Brazil. So we haven't solved that problem. The second issue that I want to talk about is, is biodiversity in working landscapes. Uh, and I'd like to use three examples if I have time, uh, but I'll be fairly quick about these. And, and if people have questions, they can always ask in the chat and I can follow up later. One is the US Conservation Reserve Program where the US government over a 40 year period paid about 8% of farmers or paid farmers to take about 8% of land out of production. The idea was to reduce global production so that we wouldn't be dumping product onto international markets and affecting prices. In fact, production increased when farmers farmed the better land and, and skipped the marginal land. So we took 8% of land out of production. We did cause a dec decline in erosion by 50% for the entire country just by taking 8% of the most marginal land out of production. Productivity increased but because the payments were linked to requirements that the farmers keep the land clean, they had to mow it. They weren't allowed to let trees grow back in it. They, we didn't have carbon payments at that time. We didn't have biodiversity payments. If we could take that program now and pay farmers for the carbon that the trees are sequestering or pay farmers for avoided de uh, soil erosion and avoided input use because of avoided soil erosion, then we would have a whole different kind of market. The same thing is kind of true in Brazil where we documented in, in uh, the year 2000, uh, a number of farms all over Brazil that were not clearing for us. They were buying degraded land and rehabilitating it and bringing it back into production. And they, they were making more money growing soil than they were growing soybeans because the value of the land increased much faster as they, as they, increased the organic matter and carbon in the soil. What they produced, in fact, is now about 15 million hectares of rehabilitated land, but about 10 million more of land that's idle now that could be used to grow carbon, but there isn't a market for it. And so we've got to figure out how to get these, these markets started. Uh, I think that's my time limit on this, so I'll, I'll stop there, Howard. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, and it, it's certainly true that uh, productivity, profitability, environmental stewardship, good governance, and social inclusion run through everything you said. Our second uh, panelist today is Susan Shamba. Uh, Susan is a lead scientist at C4 ICRAF, uh, has one of the most interesting projects that I've ever uh, been made aware of. And Susan, I'd like to ask you, what is the Regreening Africa project and how does it fit within the context of biodiversity and resilient landscapes? Susan, Thank you please. so much. Yeah, thank you so much for what I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, yes, we can. Thank you so much. So the Regreening Africa program is an eight country program that is actually looking at restoring degraded lands um, with an ambition of restoring at least 1 million hectares and benefiting 500,000 smallholder farmers. Just a little bit of a background about myself is that I am a child and a product of a smallholder farmer 
growing up in the slopes of Mount Kenya in the rural uh, areas. And so when I talk about smallholder farmers here, it's not just about theory. I'm constantly reflecting about my uh, uh, growing up and uh, the constant uh, struggle between uh, the environmental uh, elements as well as the, 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 the intensive uh, farming in order for farmers like my parents to be able to produce enough for the market, enough for, to feed us and enough to take us to school. So uh, you will have learned in this panel, or at least we will learn that at least 40% uh, of the earth's surface is used to produce food. And so it's under agriculture. And also agriculture contributes at least 70% of terrestrial biodiversity loss. So, but we must eat, we must educate kids, we must uh, you know, produce enough for the markets. But at the same time, we are talking about a, a world population of about 7.8 billion people and growing. There are at least 500 million smallholder farmers in the world, and they produce up to 80% of food that is consumed in Africa and Asia. They are stewards of increasingly scarce natural resources, and therefore key stakeholders for biodiversity conservation. Smallholder farmers play a critical role, but um, there are increasing challenges, especially when you look at climate change issues and biodiversity loss. But what I'd like to say is that from my experience, we need not to vilify agriculture or smallholder farmers, but instead to turn it around into one that happens in harmony with nature and biodiversity. We need the right technologies, such as um, you know, various agroforestry practices, the right pra policies, and the right incentives, uh, as um, you know, just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the right incentive structures for small farmers to turn agriculture into a more sustainable uh, practice. So regreening Africa um, you know, works in eight countries. We work in Kenya, we work in Somalia, Ethiopia, Rwanda in East Africa. We work in Niger, Mali, Senegal, Ghana, um, and, um, and, and Senegal and Ghana and Mali in uh, West Africa. In those eight countries, we've seen a very huge diversity in terms of what we refer to smallholder farmers and very huge diversity in terms of agroecology uh, that we are trying to work in. Very big uh, uh, elements or differences in terms of biodiversity elements, but what we've learned also is that by partnering between research and development partners, government institutions, pharma groups, we can be able to bring development objectives with smallholder farmers while embedding research so that we can be able to learn to answer the question that Howard you asked, do we have enough data? Do we have enough uh, evidence to be able to make these kind of decisions? So basically that's what the program is aiming to do. And um, I'll be coming back to the second element uh, in, in my next intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, it's very rare that on a panel we have at least two people, myself included three, that actually farmed uh, in our lives and uh, understood the landscape from that perspective. Our third panelist is uh, Meta Wilkie from the FAO. Uh, she needs no introduction. Her work in forestry uh, is legendary. And my question for you, Meta, is in light of the FAO's SOFA 2020 findings, can you tell us about the increasing need to conserve biodiversity and resilient landscapes to ensure this is included in a call for action on COVID-19 recovery. Thank you, Howard, and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, the State of the World's Forest 2020, also known as SOFO 2020, focuses on the linkages between forest biodiversity and people. And it reminds us of how dependent we all are on the diversity of ecosystems, of species, and the genetic resources found on Earth. And of how important forests and the more than 60,000 different tree species that are found around the world are in terms of providing habitats for the vast majority of all plant species, more than two thirds of all mammal species, three quarters of all bird species and 80% of all amphibian species, and not to mention millions of insects and soil microbes. 
unfortunately, we tend to take this for granted and we forget that 75% of all accessible fresh water comes from forested watersheds and that 70% of the 115 leading food crops responsible for 35% of the global food production benefit from animal pollination. And many of these pollinators live in forests. Or to take another very timely example, there are at least 28,000 different plant species with known medicinal use, and most of these are found in forests. So it is absolutely vital that we conserve this biodiversity and use the resources provided in a sustainable manner. But unfortunately, we don't. Each year, we cut down large areas of forest and convert them to other uses. And while the good news is that the rate of deforestation globally is going down, the bad news is that in just the past five years, we have deforested 50 million hectares. That's equivalent to 10 times the size of a country such as Costa Rica. Most of that loss, the vast majority of that is taking place in the tropics. And most of it is due to expansion of agriculture. 40% is converted to large scale commercial agriculture and an additional 33% to small scale subsistence farming. So as you've heard, we do need to find solutions to that and find out ways in which we can reduce the impact of agriculture on forests and other ecosystems. We also need to find out how we can increase the productivity and how we can reduce the loss and damage uh, before the food comes to our table. But let me talk a little bit about the impact on COVID-19 on biodiversity. And I'm sure that many of you remember the pictures from earlier this year of the exodus from big cities due to the pandemic and to the loss of jobs. And for many of those in developing countries, their only social protection, their safety net is comprised of the forests, the land and the sea. And this exodus brought with it an increased risk of unsustainable hunting levels and conversion of more forests to agricultural crops. And because of this loss of employment and the disruption of the value chains, there is a real risk that recovery programs will focus on the quick fix to restart the economy and forget about the climate change crisis and the biodiversity crisis. We must not let that happen. If we do, we are literally cutting the branch that we are sitting on. So this is to join my voice to a plea that we use this crisis as an opportunity to rethink our business models and development pathways and focus all the public and private efforts on building back better through the deployment of a green recovery model that will help us meet all the goals of the 2030 agenda in 2030. And I think that everybody that's listening in here today can help in this effort by adding their voices to those that argue for the need to ensure that nature positive solutions be at the front and center of COVID-19 response actions. And I just wanna thank all of you in advance for doing so. Thank you so much, Meta. It's, it... The statistics are so extraordinary when we think about what we talk about in this conversation, whether it's tree species or bird species or any type of species and what it is. And if we took the cleverest thinkers, the most talented builders, the most competent engineers and gave them a task to build a tree or a bird or an ecosystem, they would fail because these are all much smarter than us. And we are at this particular moment. Uh, a couple quick questions, one to each of you. Jason, uh, you spent years developing certification commodities. We know that certification hasn't achieved the results that we wanted. What did you learn that could be applied to a new system like the agriculture performance system? Briefly. So, the reason uh, WF and, and also I, long before I was working at WF, got involved in certification was because governments simply weren't doing their job. Uh, we also, if we wanted companies to help 
uh, buy more sustainable products, we had to define what that was. And that needed to be thoughtful, it needed to be global, it needed to be multi-stakeholder, science-based, et cetera. And so I think what we learned, even though they may have, they may have failed to capture in the, for the most part, large market share, what we learned was we could create global consensus about the six to eight key impacts of producing a commodity. That's pretty remarkable if you consider the thousands of impacts that they actually have. But more importantly, we could also see the, the value and the importance of productivity and efficiency and livelihoods as part of the definition of, of sustainability. I think, you know, at the end of the day, what we came across was consensus about the key impacts. Moving from practice to performance to, to measurement was key, and then what to measure and how to measure it. Uh, those are all key takeaways for me. And we found that in some groups like the Global Salmon Initiative, 17 of the largest companies in the world that represented 70% of global production actually joined together and shared all their data and had monthly calls to work on how they could improve performance against these credible standards. And they did. 60% of global salmon is, is certified in just six years time. Uh, now they've come back and asked, can we work on greenhouse gas emissions reductions together? To me, this is the blueprint for how change happens. It's about creating pre-competitive platforms. And I would take, take a, a little bit of exception to, to Meta's comment about COVID-19. I just completed a listening tour talking to scores of companies from different countries around the world. And what I heard is that they realized that sustainability, even staying in business is about pre-competitive behavior. They have to work together. They can't solve their individual problems without looking at the systemic issues. And so I'm confident that there are gonna be more groups like this salmon group that is looking for ways to work together to make sure that no food is left behind, no food is wasted, that even if it's not a market today, it can be shelf life stable for where the market is needed uh, in the future. So let me stop there. But I, I think there's a lot that has been learned about, about certification. And, and, and just for the final point, government has got to get in the game uh, about improving performance and, and about addressing illegality and addressing carbon emissions, you know, at a resource level. Government cannot be outside of, of what we're all talking about and working on. Thank you very much, Jason. Those are really critical points. And I know your experience on many of these uh, efforts on certification is, is critical to the furthering the discussion. Susan, um, You've described the greening of Africa, regreening Africa. How can we have a performance system like APS fit your needs for monitoring and measuring impact on the ground, particularly when it comes to smallholder farmers and local communities' a livelihood? Just briefly, yeah. please. So the smallholder farmers is, and, and especially agroforestry systems is an interesting area for biodiversity. I think we've seen a lot of focus on biodiversity in natural forest and less uh, of focus in biodiversity in agroforestry systems and agricultural lands where we are restoring through agroforestry. And so the biodiversity dividend is poorly calculated and allocated, especially when it comes to smallholder farmers. I'm talking from experience uh, from what we've seen under Regreening Africa. So for instance, even though we are restoring 1 million hectares, um, including various uh, tree species that will be integrated in the system. Do you know how much biodiversity overall will be restored? I think my answer is no. We measure or track several indicators such as soil organic carbon, soil erosion prevalence, fractional vegetation cover, which is quite abstract, shifts in household income, but we are really missing key biodiversity indicators beyond the tree species diversity that we track. So I would say that uh, an agriculture you know, performance system can really help us in terms of enriching our biodiversity indicators and tracking them. Secondly, we know that research shows agroforestry systems can 
be very rich in terms of biodiversity, including mimicking natural forest ecosystems. We've seen in countries like Costa Rica where agroforestry is rich, uh, you know, you get uh, a lot of uh, biodiversity benefits, including enabling, connecting, uh, you know, fragmented landscapes and enabling other bird species and other mammal species in terms of dispersion. So these are elements that we've seen in other countries like Costa Rica, but currently it's not something that is mainstreamed in terms of looking in other countries or other contexts like where we are working in regreening Africa. So I'd like to say that land restoration in smallholder farms offers multiple benefits. We've had the element of biodiversity, but also like to focus a lot more on, on, on aspect of livelihood, on aspect of climate change mitigation. Sometimes when we have programs in restoration like ours, there's either a singular focus on one of those objectives, either livelihood or you know, climate change or biodiversity, but not an integrated focus in terms of looking at those three objectives. And I think that by restoring lands, you're basically you know, being able to, to meet multiple objectives. So it's critical to have a system that helps us to integrate rather than just trying. It's not just, you know, it's not just about charismatic megafauna. It is about making systems more integrated and resilient for livelihood, uh, climate change and biodiversity outcomes. I think we understand also that there will be trade-offs. And so we are not just trying to maximize any of those objectives or outputs, but basically to try to optimize. So understanding those trade-offs, how would we do that without an integrated system? Last but not least is that do no harm approaches to biodiversity conservation can actually do more harm. So for trust conservation elements, aspects that we've seen in terms of fences and fines in trying to protect biodiversity areas, what we've seen is instead of protecting those biodiver the biodiversity is we see that there's various forms of resistance from local communities when they feel that they're excluded from resources, just as Jason mentioned, that the lessons that they have learned is not uh, taking into consideration cultural and, and other values that local communities really attach to some of these biodiversity hotspots. And so by failing to look at that, we really can be able to, we, we might ha have unintended consequences where we continue to see a degradation of biodiversity areas and deforestation happening. So just to say that those three things is where I think an agriculture performance system that is comprehensive can be able to help us uh, uh, both uh, measure those and assess them and monitor them over time. Thank you much, uh, Susan. And it, one of the points that you make very clearly, it's not the individual as much as it's, it's a community. And this is a really important aspect of any system. Uh, Meta, although biodiversity is facing additional threats due to COVID-19, the pandemic also presents a tremendous opportunity to build back better, which can be seen through various global initiatives, many of which you have led and are working on. How can global efforts like the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration and Resilient Landscapes help in ensure long-term public and private sector commitment to biodiversity cause? Thanks, Howard. And, and let me just start by saying, as, as we have all heard, the, there is a need to find actions that have positive outcomes for both biodiversity and people. It's critical that we do so, but it's also possible. There are a number of, of very good case studies and, and initiatives going on around the world that give us hope that there are changes happening in the way in which we produce and consume our food, for example, in the way in which we manage our forest and, and biodiversity. Uh, coming back to, to COVID-19 and my earlier comment that there's a clear tendency, for example, to focus on the quick fixes afterwards, on impacts that would help with the human health, food security, and getting people back to work. And that's not surprising. And of course, these should be the primary concerns. But we also need to make sure that we at the same time tackle these long-term crises, the climate change crisis and the biodiversity crisis. And this does mean that we have to put forward these business case for nature positive actions to make sure that they are taken up. And ecosystem restoration is clearly one of those. We know that if we restore degraded ecosystems, we can not only restore the productivity of degraded land, including agricultural land, we can also help mitigate and adapt to climate change. 
and enhance the habitat for biodiversity. And at the same time, create employment and support livelihoods and make communities more resilient. In other words, we can deal with the climate change, the biodiversity and the economic crisis all at the same time. And the upcoming UN decade on ecosystem restoration that will run from 2021 to 2030 is a great opportunity to create more awareness of this, if you will, triple win nature-based solution. And just a couple of examples of why this is so important. If we look at the employment benefits of ecosystem restoration, uh, and if we go to a place like the US and they had an economic recession, as you know, in the 2007 to 2009, and after that, they did an analysis of the number of jobs created for each million US dollar invested in restarting the economy. And one million US dollars invested in reforestation, land and watershed restoration and sustainable forest management resulted in the creation of 39.7 new jobs on average. This was by far the highest ratio of all investments and seven times the number of jobs compared to the same level of investment in oil and gas. So we know that ecosystem restoration makes sense in terms of biodiversity and climate change and economic sense too. But we also know that investing in ecosystem restoration makes sense in financial terms. Uh, we have looked at a number of different initiatives across a wide range of ecosystems and the benefit to cost ratios are between three and 75, depending on the ecosystem and the local socioeconomic context. But we have heard here, and we heard that in the previous panel as well, that there are not enough information available to be able to prepare a compelling business case for many of the local contexts in which ecosystem restoration takes place. So that's why it's so important that we work together to get those data uh, to find out exactly what it means, what species to employ, what does it mean in terms of cost and what does it mean in terms of benefits. And we find better ways of monitoring and measuring that benefits as well. And at the same time, it's crucially important that we build the capacity of local entrepreneurs to secure that sustainable finance for their plans. So within FAO and with our partners, we are in the process of finalizing a learning guide for the development of bankable business plans for forest restoration. And it's one of the priorities of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration Assistance to help people make the business case through public, private and, and blended finance instruments. And we've heard a number of those mentioned here today as well. We also hope that we will, through the platform, we will establish, uh, make this sort of a matchmaker between those with great ideas and those that are looking for bankable projects to invest in. So I encourage you all to, to keep an eye on the website as it uh, continues to develop. And we've already heard about some great initiatives here. And I would just want to say to all of those listening in that if you have additional initiatives, data, or success stories that you'd like to share on ecosystem restoration, then please do get in touch with me or with Tim Christofferson of UNEP or through the Global Landscape Forum. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to share them on the website. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we're we're going to run short of time, but Jason, I think you had two quick points to make. Yeah, Fasal, I just wanted to, to say one more thing that we learned from the certification work kind of after the fact is that the bottom 25% of performers for any commodity produce 50% of the impacts, but only 10% of the product. So if we really are interested in increasing productivity and efficiency and reducing impacts, we work with the bottom, not the top. And most certification fo programs focus on working with the top. So we need to flip our thinking we need to help them get better because of what we've learned about the top or find another way to make a better living. Uh, either is, is on the table. The second is that recently there was a lot of coverage um, in the press about 2% of properties in Brazil being responsible for 62% of deforestation and 82% and of deforestation in Brazil is illegal. So they were largely illegal operators as well. 
But if it is the case, that, which I think it's close, that Brazil and Indonesia account for half of deforestation globally on an annual basis. This means that these 2% of properties are responsible for 15% of all deforestation in the world, and it's mostly illegal. So these problems aren't huge in number. We can tackle them. We have to have the will to do that and to take illegal actors out of the system. It's a great point uh, to close on. Uh, I would like to introduce a longtime collaborator now and colleague of mine, uh, Tony Simons. Tony. Great. Um, thanks very much, Howard. And, and thanks very much to our fantastic panels. We were led off um, by Leona and then a very uh, wise and thorough uh, video from Tom Lovejoy. We had the passion of Gonzalo Munez and then two panels. Chris led us through uh, Jasper, Martin, Andre and Fabian's uh, interventions, and Howard, you've just seen the, the fantastic trio of Susan, Meta, and Jason. Perhaps one of the clearest messages to come across from all of our panelists today is that if we treat biodiversity for free, then two unfortunate things happen. Firstly, people falsely believe that biodiversity has no cost, and therefore, if biodiversity depreciates, it also attracts no cost. And secondly, as biodiversity is not assigned any uh, real value, either as a service um, or a function or an asset, we don't regard it appropriately. Now, one of the reasons that Resilient Landscapes was established was to address such inadequacies and to ensure that number one, the biodiversity dividend of landscapes is better calculated and allocated. Number two, that we demonstrate that biodiversity strengthening can de-risk landscape level investments. And three, that we ascribe real values to biodiversity as, as an appreciating asset. Now, Chris Knowles and our superb first panel uh, are a bit of an exception because many finance players grimace when they hear calls for biodiversity mainstreaming. The concept is too broad, um, we're dealing with entire biomes, we're dealing with habitats, we're dealing with species, we're dealing with genes. Biodiversity is just too nebulous and there are very few convincing answers are evident to the commercial world. They wanna know what is the return on investment in biodiversity? But perhaps a more important question is, what will it cost us if we don't invest in biodiversity? So thus far, we've not really properly answered the related question of how can business and biodiversity mutually benefit each other? And, and the comments from Jason about the lack of market for biodiversity certainly ring true there. Now, whilst finance is an essential requisite for landscape change, it doesn't have to be paramount. It doesn't have to be maximized why everything else is a tick the box low threshold. And the main business of resilient landscapes is to take ideas to designs, designs to deals, and deals to results, to returns. And we aim for a very high conversion ratio at each stage of those by optimizing five things, namely the financial viability, the technical feasibility, the operational deliverability, the environmental sustainability, and social and political acceptability. And the agricultural performance system introduced by Howard is the way we can integrate these dimensions around performance and results. So please do check out our website, www.resilient-landscapes.org and see what we might be able to do together. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the Global Landscape Forum Digital Conference. Goodbye.